Folks, I think most people are connected. Before class ends, I want to go through what's actually going to happen. So I'm recording this right now. I'll post it online so you can review it before Friday. This way we can make sure that everybody knows what's going on. OK, so you have 100% full access. You have root access to the server. Right? In the email, right, every team is on a network 10.41.teamnumber.two. The team number is also in the name of your VM. It should be very clear what your team numbers are. One through 23, or one through 24 are the team numbers. Okay. So there's actually some information behind the firewall here. So this is why I sent information to the group leaders about proxies. So this dash D8080 is saying set up a SOX proxy. So SSH is going to listen on my local port 8080. And any traffic that it gets, it's going to send it out over that network. So I can do this. Now all of my traffic is going to be coming from that machine. Well, first you have to configure Firefox. Uh, I actually, since I've never used Firefox, I just keep Firefox always in proxy mode so that I can uh, use it like that. Uh, where are the settings for this? Firefox, preferences, there we go. They like always change these. Advanced network settings, settings, and you set the SOX proxy to be local host and whatever port you put there in the dash D command. So for me, it's 8080. This is because this is what I SSH and I put dash D8080. So this is says open a SOX proxy, listen on port 8080. This way I'm telling Firefox connect to the SOX proxy at local host on port 8080. So now once I do this, when I go to, let's say we type in our team name, or our team number, here on 10.41.23.2, and I'm accessing my team name, my team from here. Right, so this is, what port is this accessing on my server? 80, port 80 on my server. So it has a list of all the services. So I can see there's a test service www that is running on port 9000, right? The machine I'm currently on is number 23, but I can change this, right? The whole point is on my server, there are two services running, a web server, a web challenge or a web service on port 9000, and a binary service listening on port 8000. Every single machine, every other team, so if you're one team, there's 23 other teams, every other team is running identical copies of these services. So by changing the IP, I can access <coughs> team one's test service, <laughs> team two's test service, and so on, all the way up to 23. Right? So this is how you can access all the other teams. You can't SSH into anybody else's machine. Trust me. Uh, right, but you can access them through the services. So the question is, where do these services live on the actual machine, right? So this is my server, now I'm on. Oh, I'll say, okay, there is, oh crap. I didn't send you guys the passwords. Ah, that's right. Yes, for the scoreboard. Okay, yes, I'll do that after this. So there is a scoreboard. Uh, there'll be a username and password. I need to send that to you. I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, because otherwise, if this is how you submit flags. So if another team has your password, they'll submit a flag as you. Or, which I guess would be good for you. Well, whatever, we don't want to allow that. So there's a scoreboard that shows you the services. It shows you how every team is doing, everything like that. Okay. But where does everything live, right? That's the important thing. So first off, the first thing you should check out is what, what users are present on our system, right? Or what users have home directories on our system. To check out the users, we check out etc password, right? So we have several users here. We have the www user, which is the default at port 80 page that we saw. So that's actually not interesting. Or maybe it is, maybe I put a back door there, but I haven't intentionally. 
Uh, the Ubuntu is the user I use to administer the server, so don't mess with this. CTF is your account, right? This is how you're playing with, the, with these things. Scorebot is also incredibly important. So there are, so we'll talk about the Scorebot in a second. Do not mess with the Scorebot directory. These other two, test service binary and test service www, right? These are the very important ones. So if we look in home test service binary, we'll see we actually have to be sudo. Why? Because the permissions here are that it's, uh, we are in the other group right here and we have zero permissions, right? Which makes sense because we have multiple binaries running, so you wouldn't want binaries to be messing with each other. So if we look in here, we see that there is a test service. There's test service.c. So I can look at this, I can see, please enter a command, read in the 199 characters in a command, enter an argument, and then some things happen. Right? But I said that these are running on somebody's, on our, on port what? What is that? 8,000, yeah. Or, wait, yeah, 8,000. Right? So I can use netcat. 8,000, and now I'm interacting with this service. So I can enter a command, I don't know, and it'll give me output. Right? So you can all do this. And when I'm accessing localhost, I'm really accessing 10.41.23.2. Yeah. And I can access anybody else's binary service by changing the IP address, right? So we're accessing these things over the network. But is this actually a network service? Is there any networking commands in here? It fits in one page. No, it's just printing stuff out, right? It's printing things out. It's using printf and scanf. So we're using the magic of a functionality uh, program called xinetd. It's a daemon that listens on certain ports that we tell it to and then invokes programs whenever it gets input from there. So it's an actually a super cool, easy way to turn a binary application into a network application. So if we look at, all you should look at your X inet D directory, there is a test service binary thing in there. And so if we look at that, we can see that this is what's actually configuring our service. So it's saying that it's running, it's expecting TCP connections on port 8000 it will accept connections from any host, and it is using the user test service binary. And when it gets executed, it executes this test service program. And every time a connection comes in, it spawns a new test service pro process. And then that test, that the cool thing is this test service process thinks that it's using standard in and standard out, but it's really happening over a network. So this makes writing it from my perspective a lot easier, and understanding what's going on from your perspective also easier. Questions on that? Yes. So to patch that, all you have to do is just recompile the code and then everything works like magic. Yes. So if you if you recompile uh, whatever the executable is in, let's see, where's the config? It's got something in here, it's got a flag, it's 
It's got a public HTML directory. So if we look at the public HTML directory, it's got a CGI bin. And it's got an index.php page. Right? So this is the content of whatever is running on port 9000 here. And there's kind of other stuff in here, so you know, you can play around with it. Um, so the configuration for this, if you want to know what maps, specifically what port to what user, I believe, uh, let's see, what is it, etc, Apache, sites enabled, yes, so inside sites enabled, there's a test service www.configuration, so looking at that, tells you that on port 9000, it gets mapped to test service www public HTML CGI bin. And the important thing is to not mess with the public HTML CGI because it's set up, Apache is set up specially such that the incoming request executes as this user, not as any other user. Um, so that way it's not executing as root permissions or www, it's executing specifically as this user when it gets executed. Questions on how to map ports to services? So what's the goal? Get the flag. Get the flag. Yes. So inside the home directories, right, inside test service www, we have a flag. And the flag is owned by root, but readable by the test service www group. And the same thing in test service binary, there is also a flag that's readable and writable by root, but readable by, oh, that's wrong. Uh, I'll have to fix that. Uh, should be legible by test service binary. That makes sense why it wasn't working. Right, and so the idea is, so this one's broken, but if we go here, right, so what did the code look like for the index.php page? What is this doing? here at CGI bin, we go up one directory, up one directory, so we're trying to access test service www flag. Do we see 
see that flag there? That flag here? We submit this on the submission system and we get some flag points. Or we get some points. Questions on kind of basic operations? I have Fix the scoreboard and stuff so I can show you how you would submit things. Uh, the game bot is broken at the moment. It's not actually distributing flags. They're fake flags that I play. One service in one cloud. Yes. So we're gonna have many services. Where are they gonna be? They will be depending on what they are and what I want to call them. They will have a user, and they'll either be web pages or they will be binary services. So it should be clear the mapping between ports and services and what they are. Yeah. Wait, so are all the flags like supposed to be just like in random? Yes. Are okay. they, they the best way? Hey guys, just a second. Let me uh, answer these questions so we're not all talking over the recording. Uh, so there are multiple, so there's going to be, there'll be flags set every 10 minutes, let's say. So new flags will be set. Each service has its own flag. So you should not be able to break into one service and access the other service's flags. Right, so every service has its own flag. It will be named flag, and everything will start with the letters FLG, so it will be super, super, super clear. Yes. We will have different services with different implementations, right? Yes, there'll be different services. They will each be different. You will. That's why you have teams, so you can kind of all work on different things. Yeah. Are, those, are the services going to be there from the beginning? Yes. The yeah. services, all the services will be there from the beginning. You'll have access to source, probably. Yeah, source. So you'll have access to source code and everything, so that should be good. Are we allowed to use like any tools to use? Okay, so let's talk about this. So we need to establish some ground rules, yes. right? Okay, so A, so part of what we're doing is we're actually checking your, that your services are available, right? Like I said, the scoreboard will tell you which ones of your services are up. So you can't just, for instance, for this, uh, X, for the one we just saw, right, the index.php page, did we just completely remove this functionality? Have we gotten rid of the vulnerability? Yes. Have we removed significant functionality from the application? Also yes, right? So the test scripts are testing to make sure you, that you don't remove the functionality. It also means that you can't block traffic into your machine from the other machine. So you can't just firewall off access to your to these IPs. So your uh, your ports need to be accessible from every other team, right? That's so that's out of bounds. You can't just firewall off your ports to the other teams. That's super lame, right? Um, okay. Let's, some other rules. Uh, you can pretty much do I think almost anything you want. Uh, the other big thing that I have to ask, because I've been trying to figure out something with Psy, and I don't think there's a really good technical way we can do this, but uh, the binaries, like we've been seeing, right? We've been playing with binaries that have ASLR disabled and that have all these security features disabled, right? So just compiling those with the correct flags is super lame, right? I mean, we haven't really gone over how to do more advanced exploits that get around ASLR and all of those things, right? So. You know, disable, uh, enabling ASLR in your system or doing something like that is super lame, so let's all agree we're not going to do that, right? It's much cooler to actually fix the vulnerability than to uh, just recompile it and hope that things go away, right? So um, I will change, I'll set it up so that when you do GCC, it automatically does all the flags for you, so you don't have to worry about that when you're compiling everything. Um, so that way you don't have to think about it, but don't be that person that tries to get around it like that, right? Because we're trying to, it's only an hour and 50 minutes, right? So the challenges have to be bite, like small enough that you're not gonna spend the eight or 10 or 12 hours it take you, took you to break one level on the homework assignment. I may do one crazy level, we'll see. But, um, but you know, so if it's just like, because it has to be simple enough that you can exploit it without all these defensive techniques. Um, so 
I think that'll be fun for everyone. Does everyone agree with those? Okay, the third option. Uh, it is super easy. Sometimes you can mess up things. If you change something, you can change something, maybe a set UID root or something. So if you do get root on somebody else's system, I don't know, let me know, send me an email, send me a screenshot of something, but don't, you know, it's only an hour and 50 minutes. It's like hard to recover from that. Um, so don't, you know, don't do anything malicious and ruin the fun for everyone else, right? Because they're competing just like you. Uh, no, that's super lame. <laughs> yeah. Can we change our tools to our environmental variables as the programs are running? In what way? So you, can, you can't change any of the input output because that's part of the specification of the program. I think that's probably all I'll say. But remember, right, remember, so patching, fixing your stuff is important, but you're gonna get way more points by exploiting. Like every time you submit a flag, it's gonna be 50 or 100 points, right? So by developing a new exploit and being able to exploit all the other teams and submit their flags, right, you get significantly more points than if you just spend your time doing defense well, now you've just limited what other people can get, but you haven't really increased your score. So it's uh, only going to come out if you're like neck and neck with another team. You'll eke out the win. Yeah. How do we submit the flag? Uh, the flags will be submitted through the scoreboard. So I don't have that working right now, and I want to get through all of this. So what I'll do is I'll leave this test environment open until Sunday, let's say. And then I'll kill it on Sunday. I'll send out emails and everything, so that way and I'll send out emails when the uh, flag system is running and putting new flags in because I have to update some configuration options because uh, I messed up one of the levels. So uh, I have to make sure that's all working. So when everything's working, you can practice submitting flags, all that stuff. That should be pretty cool. All right. Any other questions before we go? Yes. Uh, once the flag is captured, obviously it's not available to other team races. No, no, no. It's definitely available. Yeah, yeah. So other teams get credit for that too. And one of the things you should not be able to do, the system is supposed to be designed so that when you do exploit a level, you can't change the flag or something else. Uh, also, you shouldn't be able to remove your own flags, right? That's also super lame. Like, the flags are just a way to prove that you won, that you solved the challenge, right? Uh, if you just like change it to flag one, nobody's going to find that, but that's lame. All right, good? Sweet. All right, see you all on Friday, uh, Monday, we'll be in touch.